Our scripture reading this morning is found in the 111th Psalm. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart, in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let us pray together. Most gracious and holy God, as we come before you today, we come to meditate for a few moments upon your word. Father, send your spirit among us that we might understand and apply your word to our lives. For Father, we ask this through the name of our Lord Jesus and for his glory. Amen. As we have just come through the celebration of Canada Day, that day was a celebration of the story of our nation. On that day, we reflect upon who we have been called to be as a, a collection of people, of, of cities, of provinces, of a nation together. And the way in which we go about celebrating that, that day tells us a tremendous amount about ourselves. We could celebrate the day as a celebration of what God, God has called into being. It could be a day for reflection and praise to God for all that he has done. Right in our national anthem, there is the prayer, God, keep our land. And that day could be a reflection upon all that God has called to be. It could also be a secular celebration, where we simply decide to speak about what we are with no reference to God. The same could be said about all of our celebrations. Are they celebrations in which we reflect upon what God has done among us? Or are they celebrations simply of what we have done and who we are? Charles Swindoll, in his devotional book, tells a story about going with one of his daughters back to the place in which he was born in the 1930s, during the Depression. And it was a small, run-down, little tenement house that he was born in. And they, he said they went and they looked and they wept some tears over that place that was so much of, of their history as a family. And then they began to drive away from that street and that community. And Swindoll says, my daughter said to me, you've come a long way from there in your life. And he said, you know, he says, every time I come back here, 
I feel as if I'm a turtle on a fence post. He said his daughter looked at him as if he was speaking absolute nonsense. But then he began to explain. He said, you know, being raised in farm communities, he said, we knew that if, there, if you came across a turtle on a fence post, you knew that someone else had put it there. And he says, that's how I feel. Because he says, everything that I have in my life is owing to the fact that God has done it in me. God has placed me there. And so he said, my life is a constant reflection upon the grace and the power of God that has worked so wonderfully within me. Well, in a very real sense, this Psalm 111 is a description of just that type of thing. Psalm 111 is the beginning of a section of psalms. Usually we reflect simply upon Psalms 113 through 118. We call them the Egyptian Halal, the Egyptian praise. And, and what that meant was that these were, were psalms that reflected upon the deliverance of God's people out of slavery in Egypt. These psalms were sung, were recited at the Passover celebration, one of the key celebrations and holidays for the Hebrew people. And it was a celebration in which they looked back at all that God had done as he had delivered them from that slavery. It reflected upon the... the events of the, the Passover, as God judged the Egyptians but delivered his people. It reflected upon God's people and their wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, where God demonstrated to them over and over again his powerful and mighty works. It was a celebration of the key event in their history where they were brought to Mount Sinai and they met face to face with God and they saw his awesome holiness. So holy was he that the people of Israel said to Moses, their leader, we don't want to approach near to God. We're afraid of him. If we come near to him, he will judge us. So you go, you speak to him, you come back and tell us what he said. That recognition of the holiness of God was stamped into their character in those events. Well, Psalm 113 through 118, which we will look at later this summer, are the actual psalms of praise. But they are bracketed by two sets of psalms. At the beginning we have Psalm 111 and 112. And at the end we have the 119th Psalm, the longest chapter in the scriptures. And all three of those psalms share something in common. They are what are called alphabetic acrostics. What the psalmist did was he took the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, all 22 consonants. The Hebrews didn't have vowels in their alphabet. They only had consonants. All 22 letters and one after another in every half line of the psalm except for, for the very first verse the psalmist goes through that alphabet. Imagine the discipline that would be required to write something poetic that makes sense following the letters of our alphabet. But not only does the psalmist do that, but he gives us a deep and a profound understanding of what it is and what it takes or what it means for us to praise God, for us to live in reverence 
of God, which is what this psalm is all about. He calls us to understand just what true wisdom is. At the end of the psalm, he says the fear or the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Psalm 112, he'll go into that in more detail. And it mirrors this psalm. But in Psalm 111, that's the summation of all that he's saying. And what he does is he describes his praise around two great themes. There are two stanzas in this Hebrew poem. There's verses 2 to 5 and then verses 6 to 9. And in both of those stanzas he goes into the the theme that he wants to emphasize. The two themes are the wonder of God's works among his people. And then the second theme is the wonder of God's covenant among his people. If you look at the first stanza, verse 2 says, Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. And then down in verse 5, he provides food for those who fear him and remembers his covenant forever. Or more accurately, he remembers his covenant eternally. Then in the second stanza, verse 6, he says, He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. Then verse 9, he has provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant eternally. Holy and awesome is his name. Two themes. First of all, the wonder of his works. Fanny Crosby has written a hymn that we love. To God be the glory, great things he has done. And in that hymn, Crosby goes into great detail about what God has done for us in order to redeem us. The psalmist does the same thing. He takes us back into the Exodus. He has done great and wonderful things that are to be pondered by all who delight in them. Have you ever stopped? and simply pondered that, those great revelations of God that we discover in the scriptures or that you have experienced in your own life. Those times that God has heard your prayers and answered. Those times in which you have, have experienced the power of his leading. That day in which you came to know for certain that you were redeemed through the cross of Christ. Have you ever stopped and pondered those things? The grace and the compassion and the love of God. The Hebrews were called to take delight in those things. To remember the Red Sea and how they crossed through it. To remember the Jordan River and how they crossed. To remember how they were brought into the promised land and given that land because God had, had de designed it for them. To remember how for 40 years their clothing and their sandals did not wear out. And day after day God gave them manna to eat. Verse 5, he provides food for those who fear him. Have you ever stopped to ponder what it meant when Jesus met with a crowd of 5,000 people and he said to his disciples, feed them. And his disciples said, how can we feed them? We've only got a few loaves and a few fishes. And Jesus says, have them sit down. And he gave thanks for the few loaves and the few fishes and he began to divide it. And the crowd was fed and they had more at the end than at the beginning. Have you pondered what that means? Because it's telling us that the God who fed his people back in the Exodus is still at work in the Lord Jesus Christ.
we glorify God for the wonder of his works in our lives. For how he has called us together as a church, how he has blessed this nation, how he has worked in our lives and answered our prayers. But the psalmist says, take a deeper look. Because there's a promise that God has made that he is constantly fulfilling. And that is the promise of his covenant. Jeremiah 31 verse 31 speaks about how God will establish a new covenant. Not written outside us, but written on our hearts by the Spirit of God. When Jesus speaks to his disciples... And he takes the cup and he blesses that cup. He says to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What Jeremiah spoke about. You are enacting here. And you are remembering it. And you are celebrating it. And you are participating in it. Because God remembers that covenant he has made with you eternally. So not only is there the works of God and the wonder of those works, there's the wonder of his promise, his covenant made to us. At Mount Sinai, he revealed himself to his people. To Abraham, he made a promise. And the scripture says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and Abraham believed God. He believed the promise and it was counted to him, reckoned to him. The actual word is imputed to him. God took it and applied it to him as righteousness. God made a covenant with Abraham. And Abraham received it by faith. And the psalmist says he remembers it forever. He remembers it eternally. In fact, at the end of the psalm, he says this, he has ordained it forever. Think about that. God has committed himself to the fulfillment of that covenant promise in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because God is God, and God is faithful, he will never turn his back on that promise to us. The psalmist says we celebrate this because we see in that act the holiness and the awesomeness of our God. That covenant ultimately was revealed in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we gather together and when we celebrate the works of God among us, at the heart of those works is not Mount Sinai where the law was given. At the heart of it now is Calvary where the cross was endured, where the Lord Jesus Christ went and gave his life for us. D.A. Carson, in his book on the works of God and how God has revealed himself in those works, tells a story about a Muslim friend of his who he was attempting to lead to the Lord. And he said after a while he discovered that as hard as he was working at leading his Muslim friend to Christ, his Muslim friend was working hard to lead him to become a Muslim. And they were engaged in this battle of wills, if you will, to accomplish their purpose in each other's lives. And Carson says, at one point, this was during his, his days as a university student, he says, at one point, he gave his, his friend a Bible and told him to start reading at John's Gospel, which his friend began to do. 
And shortly after that, they had the opportunity to go to Ottawa and to have a tour of the Parliament buildings. And as they were engaged in their tour, they came to, to the central place in the, in the Parliament buildings, and the guides was pointing out to them all of the, the, the artwork and all of the statues that were erected up in the ceiling of that place. And was telling them what each one meant, that it was something to do with the founding of the nation. And there were great politicians and leaders. There was also Moses and the law. And all of a sudden, Carson says he hears his friend pipe up and ask a question. And the question was, where is Jesus? And the guide says, well, he's not up there. Why? Where is Jesus? Because you're saying that these, this is what your nation is, is founded on. Where is Jesus? And the guide says, well, he's not really relevant for this discussion. And the guide, or the, the friend says, but where is Jesus? And so finally, the guide says, what are you talking about? And he says, well, a friend of mine has given me a Bible and I'm reading in John's Gospel and it says the law came through Moses but grace and truth come through Jesus Christ so where is Jesus it is the crucial question for us to ask Because the answer determines what type of nation, what type of people we will be. Are we people simply founded on the law with all of its punishments and all of its denouncing of, of all that's wrong in us and there's truth in that? Or are we a people founded on the grace and truth that are revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. Because it's there that we see the heart of God opened to us. It's there that we discover that he doesn't just want to judge our sin. He wants to reconcile us to himself. And he wants so much to reconcile us to himself that he came personally in human flesh among us in order to die on the cross to give us grace and truth. The psalmist says, we ponder and we take delight in these great works of God. D.A. Carson's friend asks the question, where is Jesus? And he doesn't just ask that about the Parliament building. He doesn't just ask that about us as a nation, although it applies to us as a nation. I think he's asking that about us as God's people. Where is Jesus in your life? Have you come face to face with him and seen the grace and the truth of the living God revealed in such a way as that you will be completely changed and be part of his covenant eternally, living in reverence and fear of the living God who would do such things for you? Because that's the beginning of living a life that is marked by God's wisdom. To have come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. You will never be the same. Where is Jesus in your life? Let us pray together. Most gracious God, you keep confronting us with your truth with your presence, 
with your awesome holiness. And you lead us face to face, not only with your law, but with your grace as it was revealed in the cross of Christ. There we see our sin forgiven. There we see ourselves reconciled to you. There we see your great love given to us for all of eternity. And Father, there we discover that we will never be the same because of what you have done in our lives. Bring us to faith in the Lord Jesus and fill us with your grace and your truth, O God. For that is what we desire and so desperately need. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.